welcome. My name is Kelly Close, and I'm a co-founder of the Dietary Foundation. And as somebody who's been living with diabetes for almost 35 years, next month, I so often feel like my life is as crazy as it was right when I was diagnosed. You know, I still sometimes feel like diabetes completely doesn't make sense. But that's where data comes in. And for me, it is the forest and the trees. It's a way of making sense of things that otherwise can seem really unpredictable. So get this, 98% of the world's data storage has been generated in the last five years. Diabetes isn't immune to this data revolution, of course. In fact, we've seen diabetes both a cascade of benefits for many people with diabetes and also challenges for how that data can be best translated and oftentimes how it can be accessed. There are active benefits for tech users like coaching apps, CGM, even more advanced BGM, closed loop systems that really allow us to recognize patterns in our data and to make more informed choices. We also benefited, benefit from it in kind of population level data, at least the promise of this that makes all of the approaches we use better. Just over the weekend at the European Society of Cardiologists, it was really cool hearing these keen conversations about how time and range can be used to better understand, for example, cardiovascular disease risk. You know, prevention is really coming into the fore. Data, of course, isn't just for people who are big time tech users. There are multiple opportunities for diabetes data to help the field's incredible healthcare teams too. And not just at the practice level, at the practice level for sure, but also at the systems level, even as comprehensive data has begun, begun to be captured in electronic health records. Thank you, IDC and Abbott Diabetes Care. Just like it took me a while to understand my BGM data, my CGM data, the different ways to use time and range, it's been illuminating to see how data has represented sources of insight for our healthcare teams, rather than having it experienced, you know, as more of a burden. And so many of us remember all of those pictures of all of those cords. We're, we've come a long way and we're coming a long way. Interpreting data, obviously, still there's there's there are big challenges. We're just coming into it in many ways and an integrative approach to make it even more possible for providers to personalize treatment plans. And we hope we'll learn more about this from our panelists today, how this can ultimately help approach the best care imaginable for everyone. As we continue to embrace what is already transformative technology, then we'll be closer to knowing how to get closer to the right therapies as well as the right approaches. As a longtime diatribe columnist and now a behavioral health expert, Adam Brown would say food, exercise, mindset, and sleep, and getting smarter on all of these. Today, we're so excited that we're going to hear from for elders in the field about what this explosion of data means for patients, healthcare providers, systems, policymakers, how it will continue to improve diabetes management and care. Before we start, let me give you just a rundown of the event. So in a minute, I'm going to get to introduce our four illustrious panelists for the main discussion. This will be followed by some audience questions, and I encourage you, we're really pleased with you, please add your questions in the stage chat throughout the discussion. Members of our team are going to be collecting the questions, and the panelists will answer as many as they can. As usual, we'll have polls going out too, so thanks in advance for answering those and helping this become as interactive as possible. After the panel is complete, I hope you'll stay online and join a community session with our fantastic community manager, Sharice Shockley. We'll also have networking and expo booths open for you after the panel. So before going any further, I'd just like to express my absolute and sincere gratitude to our sponsors who have made this event and all of Diatribe's work possible. A huge thank you to our incredibly generous presenting sponsor, OneDrop, for their leadership support. OneDrop is so on the forefront of digital health and working to help keep people healthy before problems a lot arise. And just as we look at health in a much more holistic way. And Jeff, you really helped me do that as well as your team. So thank you. We love your focus on prevention. Thank you to our bold sponsor, Abbott Diabetes Care, which does so much to improve the lives of people with diabetes and to make CGM widely available. And thank you to our dedicated silver sponsors, Sanofi, Dexcom, AstraZeneca, Dompe, Lilly Diabetes, Medtronic, Nova Nordisk, Prevention Bio, Vertex, Xeris, and Zealand. We owe you so much for helping so much happen at Diatribe. 
Without further ado, I'm thrilled to welcome the following leaders to explore today's topic of diabetes data. First, we have Chris Fulton, who's been the head of diabetes for Sanofi US since early 2020, after having served at the company in a variety of other leadership roles, including head of their global diabetes digital solutions team. Not only is he an expert in the field, but he also has a very personal connection to diabetes. His daughter, Emily, has had diabetes for over five years since she was eight. Next, we have Jeff Dawkins, who's the CEO and founder of OneDrop, a precision health company using real-time health data, artificial intelligence, and on-demand telehealth to help deliver personalized preventative care to people with diabetes and other chronic conditions globally. Long-time leader in the development of digital technologies. He's been thinking about this for a really long time. Jeff is at the forefront of the explosion of digital health platforms to help people with diabetes and other metabolic conditions be really proactive about better health. And then we have the incredible Holly McGuera, who has years of experience working in the diabetes field, thinking about data after starting her career as a clinician. She's had leadership, many leadership roles in diabetes and has spent most of the last decade with a hyper focus on data and often healthcare systems level data at Gluco. She's now a consultant and advisor in the field, sought after by so many for her deep relationships across the diabetes ecosystem. And she's a vocal advocate for patient access to technologies and data. Finally, we have Dr. David Price, who has a wide range of experience in the field as an endocrinologist and now for over a decade as the VP of Medical Affairs at Dexcom. David has been at the center of this research that has really made CGM such an important tool for optimizing diabetes management. He plays a key role in providing the medical input behind creating the new tools and solutions for people with diabetes. I could go on and on, as you can tell, about the breadth of experience that our panelists have here. That would take me days, so I'm going to jump in now, and I'll start for a question. With, start with a question um, for you, David, on the expansion of data collection. You know, we've seen this massive increase in the patient usage of data capturing devices and apps since the start of the pandemic. How do you think that's been driven by the pandemic and the increase in telemedicine? You know, versus kind of expected growth that was happening pre-pandemic. Yes, um, thanks, Kelly. First of all, thanks for having me participate in this panel. It's really what a great group of people to, to be on the panel with. So appreciate that. Um, the explosions really occurred with the use of Clarity and Clinic. So the the rise in Clarity has increased, been increasing over time. Um, measure it with the the growth of CGM, and then there was a boost as we developed um, um, the mobile Clarity app, which pushed notifications to users. But the real real with the onset of the pandemic, the growth in clinic use has been um, far greater. And I think it's for obvious reasons. It, 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 the clear use of clarity in the clinic has enabled healthcare professionals to um, have discussions with patients about their data outside of a face-to-face -face office visit. Yeah, that's, and it's, it's, been, it's been really powerful to have heard over time what couldn't happen um, to see it happening. And thank you guys for, for propelling so much of that. Um, Jeff, I want to ask you, you know, sort of on the same lines, any comments that you have on this question? Also, you know, OneDrop has gathered tens of billions of data points from the users of your connected devices and predictive health platforms. So, um, like, what is that number again, if you can tell us, um, of all of the data points and then what's being used, done, done with the data? How is it being most leveraged to improve outcomes for people with diabetes? Let's see, about our, our data, we have, we gathered over 30 billion unique health data points from integrations with thousands of popular apps and devices used by millions of people worldwide. Um, this data includes like glucose information, A1C, blood pressure, weight, physical activity, medications, food, heart rate, and other self-care data like sleep, um, personal data like gender and year of diagnosis. And then, you know, this is really powering our predictive platform. And it's really only with this sort of vast scale and diversity of data that it that has allowed us to sort of create these predictive insights that power the, the platform for individuals as well as the coaching and, and in app experience. As far as outcomes, um, you know, our members are showing elevated um, 
our, 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 our members with elevated blood pressure are using one drop to reduce their systolic blood pressure. The reduction is even more significant with members with stage two hypertension using one drop. You know, the data is really um, meaningless without action. And so, you know, you can generate a lot of data, but unless somebody's able to, you know, take action on it, um, it, it's useless. And so the OneDrop platform really makes it easier for people to not only access their health data, but feel empowered to act on it. Mm -hmm. And that happens through a personalized telehealth experience, obviously, coaching, uh, you know, forecasts and, and glucose predictions, blood pressure insights, um, and, and a variety of other ways in which we're empowering both our coaches and, you know, the end users to take action on all that data. Yeah, I totally hear you. I mean, I, I mean, and I remember we were so lucky when you came into the field. You know, I think it's been also in recent years, I think I was always kind of worried about, God, I don't even know what all these things mean. And so as you've helped make us smarter about owning our data, um, it's really compelling. So thank you. You know, it's interesting just to add on that, you know, we look at our data assets or data collection more generally as sort of a real world EHR. Everybody always talks about electronic health records and getting access to them and, oh, that's where all of the information lies. But really, you know, all of the data that you generate living your daily life and making the choices about food or making your choices about medication or sleep or stress or the physical activity that you have or your blood glucose readings over time, all of that information is really, you know, where I believe health lives. It doesn't live in some doctor's office with some notes that you can't read. It lives in the day-to-day, -day, moment to moment, 8,759 hours a year that we're not at the doctor's office. To totally, I'm so, I'm so with you. And I'm the gonna... real world electronic health records. Is yes, I, uh, and I love that. And the, and the cool thing about electronic health records is that it also can show for the world of all of us, like what is what is happening at those levels. But yeah. I'm totally with you. I'm going to move to Chris. You know, this was so cool to see the national survey that Stan, if you did with ADCES, um, that also gave a lot of amazing information, really valuable information on patients' relationships to diabetes data. Can you talk about, you know, what were some of the main takeaways from that survey? Um, how is diabetes data on an individual level and real world evidence across populations impacting your work and um, and your biggest hopes and dreams? Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Great to be here. So, yeah, so with this topic today around um, the future of data and the future of technology, um, we thought this study, which was conducted last year uh, with 700 uh, people living with either type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes on insulin, was really relevant to share a little bit to understand the, the situation we face. And there was some, some really interesting data. As you say, this was um, led by ADCS and sponsored by Sanofi. So, um, so we, we, really asked, we really wanted to understand a little bit more about the complexity of day-to-day -day living with diabetes and of course, what may help. And I think all the people on the panel here have a huge part to play. But I think some of the information we found was, was really interesting. So some, there were a few paradoxes in there as well. So 65% of people felt that they were doing everything they could to manage their diabetes on a, on a daily basis. But in a separate question, 67% of people felt that they still felt guilty they weren't doing enough. So of course, people are trying their best, but of course, they're always hoping um, there's a bit more. And again, no surprise, again, a similar number, two thirds, wish their diabetes information was simpler and easier to use overall. Um, there were some um, fascinating when you think about what else can we do to help 80% um, of people felt that this, that this ins they're all on insulin, bringing the insulin management, the insulin monitoring into these ecosystems alongside the CGMs, the BGMs and the great software provided by the, uh, the people on this panel again would be really beneficial. Um, and of course, they, they talk about some of the issues. 62% um, talked about being too busy to log or had forgotten their insulin management on a particular daily basis. And I think to summarize all of this, when we think about setting the frame for some of our discussions tonight, 80% of people thought it would be, be good to have a more personalized understanding of their diabetes, makes managing and tracking their insulin less time consuming and feel more empowered to manage their diabetes. And I think that's what we're all here for, aren't we? We're trying to give people tools to simplify, as you say, real life. This is not a clinical piece. This is about day-to-day -day living and, make, and empower people to take better control of, of their diabetes. So I thought maybe we all know this and we want other people to understand this, but I think it helps charge us up to say we can all do more um, to improve this landscape overall. Well, and so amazing also about helping make sure that, that we're all 
finding out as much as possible about, you know, by these care and education specialists and making sure that people have access to them and are learning from them. Um, and Holly, that's leading into you, you know, with the advancement of devices and the data that they capture that you've had so much to do with over your incredible career. What do you think is like possible now that wasn't before? And how do you see it benefiting patients, entire systems, healthcare providers, et cetera? Yeah, I think, um, well, first of all, thank you again for, for having me. And I feel very honored to be here with these with these luminaries, with, with you, Kelly. It's just uh, really incredible. And um, it is something I feel really strongly about because I think that, that data is something that has been, in many ways, it, it, it has been uh, kind of a burden and, and is also uh, very much a solution for us. And, and the old days, it was data that came out of device. It was sort of locked in there. And now we have the opportunity for this data to be layered, to be shared, and to provide insights that we didn't have before. And I really share Jeff's view of the world with data, that it is about having this, this access to the data that comes. It's not just glucose, but it is also exercise. It's the medications you take. It's also uh, what if we had blood pressure and what if we had pulse and we had sleep and we had all these other biometrics that were seamlessly layered together and could provide people genuine insights and then could have that data flow and solve problems for physicians, healthcare providers, so that we could have standardized views in EHRs. So um, I think that we have an opportunity, we have all the components to solve the big problems in diabetes and look at data as an enormous solution. Um, and it's not just glucose data, but it's the beginning. And, um, <laughs> It's, it's, it is the beginning of something I think really big. Um, and ironically enough, COVID has kind of, uh, with all of the terrible things that have happened, it's helped bring forward uh, some tremendous opportunities for us to understand the value of telemedicine, remote monitoring, the use of platforms and standardization of uh, views and flow, automatic flow of data into EHRs and to give people insights, meaningful insights. So all of this comes together. It's not just about big data for researchers anymore. Holly, let me jump in on that one. I think COVID has been a help. It, 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 I mean, it, it, it's enabled reimbursement for remote office visits, which you know, people have, have thought that remote visits would be powerful, but again, there it, it was lim very limited and right. COVID forced the issue and enabled healthcare professionals to, to get compensated for, for these visits also. So it's really, really made a hu huge impact um, for healthcare delivery. Yeah, and I-, and I, I go away. Yeah, I, and, I, and I hope that we see more of that to lessen the burden for healthcare professionals and to start to, um, start to see standardized views of data so that we have individualized views for people with diabetes and for healthcare professionals, we can have this data flow into EHRs in a way that become like, you know, what we used to in, envision um, with AGP and, and the very early things that came out of um, IDC. But now we're looking at, um, there was a terrific piece that came out of ADA with the uh, 2020 BGM um, um, uh, compendium. And it looked at CGM and BGM views that could automatically go into uh, EHRs. And it's almost like an EKG. And so healthcare providers wouldn't have to be sitting there, you know, looking at their computer the whole time, but in fact could look at what could be a, a standardized uh, uh, view that could go into EK, uh, that could go into EHRs. Things like that, where data could be simplified for 
healthcare professionals and been really very much individualized for people with diabetes. That's where I see us going. I like that. I like that, Holly. I was just going to, I was just thinking about that a little bit. You know, as you were, as you were saying it, we were hearing from Dennis Goldensong out there in the audience about like, not everyone has access to all of this. And it's like, it is absolutely so true. And I know we're going to touch on some of that. Um, it is also true. Sometimes maybe healthcare professionals may not even know what you have access to. I know like, you know, professional CGM used at least once a year, like Everyone ostensibly anyway has has access to that. I know DQ&A has done some really illuminating work showing that actually something like 40 percent of people with type 2 diabetes who have access to CGM, their doctors don't like necessarily always know it. So so hang t hang tight on this. I want to say are there. Um, if there are, you know, responses to that, um, I think Jeff, this touches on a bunch of stuff that you were saying, and you're you're coming from tech. I mean, there's also, you know, data like from Apple HealthKit or Fitbit or you know other other platforms. If you can talk a little bit about that, um, as that is related to all of your integrations, of course, that'd be cool to know. And how do you react to it? How do your members react to it? Any feedback from coaches? Yeah, you know. Um... I, you know, we live our daily lives sort of with a breadth of um, behaviors and a breadth of, breadth of inputs that affect our conditions, right? It's not just one thing. Um, but I got to give a hats off to David and to Dexcom, first of all, just here. Um, Dexcom's been, one, an amazing partner of OneDrop, but two, um, really a strong voice in the industry for providing access to a crucial component for people to have um, information to make decisions on. Um, and I applaud, you know, Dexcom's openness um, in doing so. We we utilize Dexcom data to create CGM predictions, and and um, it's really, you know, just awesome. So thank you, David, and thank you for your entire organization. Um, you know, we we believe that you know the that that it's really how the data is used to support people along their journey of day-to-day -day life. It's not just one instance or one type of data, but a breadth of data. And so in partnership, you know, with a variety of different sort of players, like you mentioned, Apple, Apple Watch, um, Apple Health Kit, Dexcom, Fitbit, um, Withings devices, et cetera, we ingest, you know, an incredible amount of data. Um, and, you know, we did a survey with Diabetes Mine, we, we, you know, the, the uh, Amy Tendritz organization, where we surveyed more than you know, 2,000 US adults with diabetes. And the results presented at D-Data Exchange showed that people with diabetes are begging. They're begging for more secure, affordable, and fully integrated technology. They're tired of their silo-based information sets that don't talk to each other, that don't integrate with anything, and then in the end aren't really useful. You know, we go through the pain of pricking our fingers every day. What do we do? We write it down in a log book, a bloody log book, and then it, it never shows up anywhere. And then we just lie to the doctor when we get there. That's not how we can, you know, do well anymore. So OneDrop's making it really easy for members to access all of the relevant health data in one place and feel powered, you know, to act on that. And then we we power our platform with, again, AI-powered insights and on-demand coaching. 94% of OneDrop users think that the predictions that we offer are extremely useful. And the members that have reported to their coaches have a better understanding of how their actions affect their health. Actions affect your health. And that's a product of data. It's a product of insights and coaching. And it leads to better, you know, sort of action on that information. And so... You know, that, that's kind of how we're 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 yeah. looking at a data ecosystem, bringing in all that information, and then helping people take action on it. Yeah, and I'm sure the coaches are learning from each other. And the more I think, again, that the electronic health record is showing the field. Um, you know what's being seen on out there is really cool. Um, but thank you for thank you for that. Um, David, I was just powering up my, I was looking at my clarity earlier today. So you guys, David, I asked him um, like years ago, several years ago now, can you just show me like what percentage I'm on the closed loop? I use Dexcom, you know, can you show me what percentage of time I'm over 250? Cause really I should never be over 250. Um, you know, careful what you wish, wish for, right? Um, <laughs> we, you made that happen. Many people asked for it and now we can see it. And still, so we don't necessarily always act um, like we, like to act. Um, but clarity, I mean, can you talk more about the way patients see trends, the way they produce supports of data? We know it's seen a dramatic increase. 
from a low base. So what have you seen in terms of how patients interact with the data? What do you think of what their healthcare professionals say? What do you think about what the payers say? Um, give us your take. Yeah, I think it's what's really helped is some of the standardization and reporting and the standardized metrics. So it used to be like everybody would do things differently and we had our strategies. We still have some of the strategies which, which, which I'll get to. Um, but um, having, you know, understanding that time and range goals should be around 70%. Now that's not a reasonable goal for many people, but even improving it by 5% time and range is thought to be meaningful. Trying to limit the amount of time less than 70 to under 4% and, and, and under 54 by 55 by 1% and limiting the time at, at very high glucoses. Um, so knowing what, what targets are and trying to get um, small improvements has really, really is, has been um, very helpful. Um, so one of the things that, that Dexcom has recognized is that data is being used a couple of ways. Number one, at the moment to, to inform your immediate treatment decision, but that the people that do best are those that look, look back at time retrospectively at their glucose data, and that's what, what clarity enables. So we established the, the weekly notifications that um, could come to people and they could it encourage somebody on their mobile app to be able to look at clarity data, to understand what their time and range is, what their best days were, um, to, to facilitate better informed treatment decisions that occur over time. We've recognized that the more engaged people are, and we've published on this, the more engaged they are, the more they use share and follow, the more they use uh, the retrospective reviews, um, the more they use alerts, is associated with better glucose control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I worked on the dark side, um, well, <laughs> which has been almost 20 years ago, you know, it, it felt like the cardiologists had a lot of data also. And it felt like they were really being compensated for like thinking about it and developing the insights. And I wonder what you think about that. Is that happening now um, in diabetes as well? Repeat the question, I'm sorry. Well, that just are the doctors getting, getting reimbursed, compensated? Are they being recognized for the time that it takes to do this? Because it, it can take time and it's so valuable, but you know, they're having to create a lot of time as well. So I just wonder yeah, yeah. if there's an improvement. I mean, there's been there's been an improvements in reimbursement for um, for CG, reviewing CGM data that's been around there, and I think more and more um, clinicians now now that they're using their Clarity Clinic are, are billing for it and getting compensated for their time. Yes, but when they're not paid, endocrinologists still aren't paid like cardiologists. Just to, just in case. Uh, not know. not not yet. <laughs> like from Stanford, maybe not yet. Um, yeah. But. But I know we've seen improvements on that front and maybe telling patients about that as well to yeah. make to remind their healthcare providers about it. Um, Chris, we, you know, we know that the entire field, um, of, of course, has access to more of this data and along the same same lines as what David has been talking about, you know, whether you're a patient or a GP or an endo or even if you're collecting population level data for research, there's a lot that can happen. And also like cheers from all of us patients uh, for the clinical trials more and more that are using CGM and time and range um, during part or all of their trials. So I'd love to know, what do you think about that? Like at the, on, the, on the side of research where you're seeing some of that be used so you can see what's working on, on use for different therapies, et cetera. Yeah. And we'd also love, Maybe even to maybe even before that, you know, as a parent of a child with diabetes, what's the psychosocial impact of more and better um, diabetes data? So that's a lot. That's a lot right there. But I just wanted to try to build on what David was saying um, for a sec. Yep. No, I'll, t I'll take them in order. Um, you know, coming from a larger pharmaceutical company, we're, we're used to generating you know larger traditional clinical trials. Um, we call them randomized controlled trials, where you really try and monitor the individual effect of a drug. So that's the traditional way we work. Um, we're also very interested in the personalized data and have an interest in technology as well. So all the areas that we've been talking about up until now. I think the interesting space that we think about for both drugs, but also for devices is how you think about uh, real world evidence uh, and how you generate that. So I think for all of us, we're all very, I love Jeff's passion, et cetera. Uh, you know, we, we also have a responsibility to generate the right data for the future so we can be um, even more powerful in our asks going forward. So I think the fact we need to think carefully around what data do we collect in, in what way on an aggregated basis, 
how do we put the data together? So obviously we're helping the individual and they feel really empowered and feel great that the information they have and they're, and they're taking action, as Jeff said. But how do we aggregate that data to help the, the providers initially and then to the next level up, how do we bring it together for the payers? Mm -hmm. Because we really want this stuff to move and I, I heard the comment around better access. We have to really show the value and the more we show the value, the more we can ask um, for, for the reimbursement overall. So. As a pharma company, yeah, we have good experience in that, that larger scale data. We want to work with smaller companies who have the expertise with the technology and bring that personalized aspect. And how can we bring together those combinations of say drug plus devices in, in whatever combination we can think of and then look at look at those, uh, those ecosystems together and look at what data we can generate, perhaps in that real world setting where it's not just about um, efficacy and safety. We start to look at patient experience and we look at things like persistency, which is so critical as well. So I think that's really, really um, something we need to think about um, holistically and almost we're all rushing forward so quickly with, with data and technology. We sometimes don't stop to breathe to think about all the setting ourselves up for that long term success. Mm -hmm. And are you, are you optimistic about data helping show where people should be using, I don't know, like helping figure out maybe it's dose, maybe it's frequency, maybe it's timing of insulin, maybe it's that you, you know, might benefit from moving on to an SGLT2 or a GLP-1, maybe instead of a sulfonylurea or something else that's causing hypo, you know, how, how optimistic are you about um, getting some of those recommendations in? So the, so the trick, and, and, and David will be a real expert in this, is how you design and how you think about what you're going to track. And, um, and one of the, the, the challenges of real-world evidence is it's not pure data like a randomized control trial. So there are lots of confounders in the analysis. And again, you can do uh, things like pragmatic um, real-world evidence trials where you try and match groups and try and look at the, the differences a bit like you do in a controlled trial overall. So the short answer is, Kelly, uh, we can. We can look at all of those pieces, but I think it's how you set the, the trials up. Um, maybe, David, you want to comment on that, you know, or, or Holly, yeah. how we think about the fields we set. Um, but it's got to be quite sophisticated to be as precise as perhaps you're asking for. But who knows? I think we know with data, the sky's the limit. And we, we sit here now, we feel good about what's happened in the last five years. What, what's going to happen in the next five years? Well, I, I'll just comment that um, we have heard from FDA that with um, with randomized controlled trials, that um, they recognize that real world evidence is uh, much more indicative about what's really happening than the than the uh, gold standard of randomized controlled trials. That being said, I've not seen anyone rushing to change. Um, uh, their plans to have randomized controlled trials relative to uh, indications uh, and for uh, what they're using for major studies. So I think it's a real, real conundrum right now, candidly. Yeah. Um, not sure yeah, yeah. drug trials I'd suggest changing over to um, uh, real world evidence, but I do believe that real world evidence is what is going to drive um, a, a very compelling case for expanding uh, indications of use. Yeah, we do both. I mean, Dexcom mm -hmm. is, um, yeah. you know, we run um, randomized controlled trials and the objectives of those are often to change standards of care which right. could then be used to drive reimbursement. Right. So we need to do RCTs for that purpose because you need a, a certain level, a certain um, level of evidence in order to get um, payers to, to change what they do. But the real world evidence, we also generate a lot of that. We've generated a lot of evidence, for example, in COVID showing that during COVID, 60% of people improve their control, 40% get a little bit worse. And, mm -hmm. and the mean, increment, mean change was, People's control improved during COVID. I mean, that was fascinating. Um, we could we could look at um, benefits in, in populations. There was a paper published um, in JAMA recently from Kaiser um, comparing people that use CGM versus those that didn't with type one and type two, and and trying to get rid of all the confounders and co and co covariants, and found you know very striking benefits of CGM, which I think will will help um, influence their system. So. You know, they each have their roles, um, and yeah. I think you just have to be really thoughtful in the experimental design, you know, Great. to what questions you want answered and what's the best way to get to it and who's the customer. Mm -hmm. right. 
Yeah, yeah, I love that. And we're all the customer. I mean, everybody, yeah. on, the planet, everybody on the planet is the customer. Yeah. You know, I, I think sometimes it's kind of fashionable to talk about inertia. Um, you know, on the other hand, like what is the capacity of time that people have to work and um, how is that being valued that came in um, from the audience? <clears throat> well, any thoughts about, about what traditionally might have been thought of as inertia or how you guys feel about inertia? That could be clinical inertia, that could be like therapeutic inertia. Um, I suppose, Holly, it could be inertia related to policy and what what could happen there. Yeah, I I mean the the sad thing is that we have fabulous devices, we have fabulous drugs, and the right now we all know that uh, diabetes in the U.S. Um, uh, the evidence is is that things are are getting worse. And we have um, a, sl a small portion of the population that has great access, that has great coverage and um, gets wonderful care. And we have a whole lot of people that are getting sicker. And, um, and, and so I think we need to sort of look at this and, and obviously we have some big systemic problems and we need to figure out how we improve uh, how we improve access, how we improve uh, coverage, how we improve you know the the ability for people to have access to all of these things, and it can't be more of the same. Mm -hmm. uh, of that I'm I'm quite convinced, mm -hmm. and um, I think it's going to require some. And this is not a very popular uh, view, but I think it, it okay. is the reality is that we started getting greater access and greater use of blood glucose monitoring, not when we had DCCT that gave us clinical evidence that was unreliable, that, you know, that complications could be avoided if, if people were checking more, but it, it came about when, the, um, when Medicare provided broad coverage and then private payers followed. Um, I think it's going to come down to broad policy changes that change the uh, the coverage and provide much broader and more generous um, uh, use of preventative rewards for people that are taking care of people with diabetes, um, our healthcare professionals. And um, I think that healthcare professionals and I think that uh, people with diabetes have been under an enormous amount of financial pressure. And um, I don't think we can keep going to that well. I think we uh, have got to have, uh, we've got to change some big policy uh, uh, ways of doing things. And we need to look at what we can do to provide better support and looking at individuals as a whole and all of this data and say, it's not just a glucose reading, but it's also, we have to look, how do we prevent cardiovascular disease? How do we prevent kidney disease? And, and let's start rewarding people for keeping people healthy. And, um, and that means that let's use data to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, it means changing everything from just getting better at supporting coding and coverage and getting a lot better at providing support for keeping the, in, the individual as a whole healthier mm -hmm. preventative care and not just getting ready for the next intervention when someone is sicker. So um, it, it's, a, it's a big policy thing. Mm -hmm. But I think we're, we have the ability to get to the steps along the way. That's a very big answer, I know. It is a big answer, and thank you, Jeff. I'm gonna go back over to you because you were talking about cardiovascular health, you know, heart health, kidney health, et cetera. What do you think? Well, I couldn't agree more with Holly that prevention is really where, um, you know, where things have to go. And the unfortunate fact is, is that, you know, payers don't pay for, for prevention. They just don't. Um, they pay for treating sickness. And so all the money is actually made of, you know, $3.8 trillion in annual healthcare costs. And 90% of that is going towards chronic conditions. Um, you, you really are talking about a payer system that rewards the 
you know, the treatment of sickness, not the prevention of those things in the first place. So Holly, I, I couldn't agree more. Let me step further into Holly's conversation. Like uh, we have to address the fact that the United States subsidizes corn production, which subsidizes corn sugar, which is in literally every single piece of food that we eat or that you can buy at the grocery store, which, you know, nobody wants to talk about. But um, I think, you know, we have a big food problem that's generating, you know, an excess amount of carbohydrates in our bodies in the first place. So let me just throw that one out there. And then we have a payer system that only pays for stuff once you're already, you know, making a lot of choices that um, lead you down a path where, um, you know, you're sick. And so um, I don't know if more coverage, I don't, I don't know if increasing the amount of money that we pay for the kind of coverage that we currently have or the kind of stuff that we currently have is actually going to make a dent in, um, in people's health. We've been doing this now for decades, 3.x trillion dollars a year for decades. And as Holly mentioned, it's getting worse. So what's the definition of insanity? It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Providing more, more money for more of the same is not going to work. I think we need comprehensive transformation of our approach to health, you know, with an emphasis on prevention. We're facing an insurmountable economic burden and human toll. And, you know, we're just not going to wait anymore. We've got to provide a new way of doing this, a transformed way of doing this, a more precise way of providing people with access on their mobile phones to information they can use to make choices every day, the 8,759 hours a year that they're not at the doctor's office because the healthcare system and more money at it and more access to it isn't generating better results for us. Okay, well, one one quick thing I will say, I know all of us were, um, you know, <laughs> who saw the data come out um, and thank you to patients because you're the ones who are reporting it. But, you know, when data comes out showing that as a population, we're doing worse, obviously it's really, really disconcerting um, and troubling. And I do also think that if we could start to stratify some of that data and see, well, where is it getting better and what do the approaches look like on those fronts? You know, therapy is foundational. Food is foundational, right? But we don't necessarily know um, who's doing better and all of those who, who aren't doing as well. Um, so other uh, other comments on this, you know, what's it going to take um, for 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 payers to to change things on the short and long term front? Are you guys seeing um, payers start to to look at things a little bit differently in terms of, you know, maybe therapies or technologies that change the short term? Um, like next generation glucagon, there were last time it was measured 230,000 people in the United States went to the emergency room for severe hypoglycemia. You know, that number is going further down for the people who have access, right? Um, for, for this next generation glucagon, which we're seeing is almost everyone, the zero co-pays, at least from all of the commercial insurers is something we've been happy about seeing. But things like that, you know, fewer people going to the hospital for DKA. Are you guys, are you optimistic about um, payers addressing those ends? Um, what would you like to see? Yeah, let me jump in a little bit and address, uh, I, I, I want to be more pragmatic and short term and focus on glucose. That, that's the world that, that I know. Um, and although Overall, glucose control has maybe worse or maybe the same. People that access technology do better. I mean, and that's been clear in every registry. So we see it in clinical trials, we see it in real world evidence, and we see it in registries. So, so people who access technology do better. Um, so we need to, to grow access to technology. And that's, there's, that's gonna be done several ways. So number one, you know, we need good reimbursement from, from payers. And, and that's really improving, you know, significantly. And, and it, it inches forward um, and it inches into the poor people. So there's more and more Medicaid states in which they're providing some coverage for CGM. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort, but um, and a lot of um, um, both from, from industry as well as from, from advocates uh, but but it, it is getting better, and it, as as people could access devices, we will see these people that access them do better. We also need to make devices simpler 
We need to keep making the, the process to get them and use them simpler. We need to get data integrated into EHR so that primary care clinicians and others could look at the data and inform better decisions. So all of this is gonna happen. And I, so I am optimistic that, that access will improve and care will get better. And it is in the people that are using technology. Mm -hmm. If I can, if I can build on David's point, I, I agree. It's hard to follow Jeff with the with the transformation. Um, I think firstly on the inertia, I think we have very good examples of of the patient voice, um, and we know in many many ways that, that we work with uh, providers that you know, um, patients taking information back to the providers. People are open; they understand. People have access to the inf information, and I think people are willing to show differences. And I think the technology space is a, is a great example where that mobilization um, has made a difference. So I think the, the movement bit by bit is a, is a good way to start. I, you know, we have the big sort of transformational idea, but I think um, we, we do see bit by bit, we can make a difference compared to how we were five, 10 years ago. Um, on the payers themselves, um, you know, having had a number of payer conversations, they're very open and they're very interested in this space. Um, you know, clearly we, we, we talk about you know, drugs and pharmaceuticals in a traditional way. But, but when you talk about new concepts, new ideas, other ways um, to improve outcomes, um, they're very open and receptive to those ideas and they're willing to partner and pilot different approaches. Now, the challenge for us is we, in some ways we don't have stable products. We're still all learning about what's the best way to do this. And of course, we all know that in three, four, five years time, it's going to get better. So that's kind of like fluidity is a bit of the challenge we have. But I think I think the positive here, Kelly, is, is is they are willing to partner with us on some projects. Again, going back to that point around generating the right real world outcomes, and at the end, placing a value on what they see. And the good news is, from the many bits of data we've seen, um, all of these technologies have a great impact on things like A1C control. Um, so I think you know the the future is bright there. That you know beyond the drug, you know we know pretty much every single one of these um, management platforms have had a positive impact. And I think when we get this all clear in the in the right setup with payers, pe um, people will place value and they will reimburse them in the right way. So, so I, I think the future is bright because people are open and receptive, and it's up to us to put those um, the right checks and balances in place to get the right data. So, so I think we can do this. It's going to take a bit of time and a bit of patience to get there, but um, I think we can move forward incrementally in this way with payers. I'm a little nervous to go right back to you, Jeff, because of what we just heard. I know you're not super optimistic about payers, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Like, what do you think? You're doing so many good things on people with prediabetes. You know, you're helping to you're helping people to avoid type two or cardiovascular, you know, events, things like that. Um, what can you say about about what you'd like to see on prediabetes, and how can we, as part of the diabetes ecosystem? persuade payers to cover more interventions. Um, and that's, that could be, that could be thinking about food. It could be thinking about activity. Um, yeah. What do you think? You know, I mean, I mean, a company like Omada, you know, has done a, a really great job, you know, in the pre-diabetes space on getting people to, you know, commit to losing weight and, you know, they, they can, they've proven in multiple studies as have we, as have others, um, you know, that you can, um, you know, get real, clinical benefit from um, some of these types of programs. Um, I think it's really the employers that have been leading the way in terms of paying for this type of solution um, because the benefit shows up right away, you know, sort of in the costs of caring for people that, you know, move from pre-diabetes to diabetes. You, you see the savings immediately. I mean, in, in, in less than a year, you know, you, you're recouping your your output and, and then immediately showing, you know, positive ROI on that. And so, I think you know the data exists for this type of uh, you know preventative programs, and the payers are just really not not used to paying for prevention, right? And so I I, I think you know, again the data exists. I think the programs exist. I think there's a well worn path. The cost savings exist, um, and I'm hoping you know in terms of inertia um, that some of the inertia in in the payer space sort of moves in in the other direction because I think you know it's a crucial step. Yeah. Yeah, I would also say I know, and Charisse would remind me, um, you know, that it's we also know that there are there's more room to access PAPs, you know, patient access programs. If yeah. the word is out there, you know, is the design and the delivery about those is that there? Um, and Chris, you know, we really salute you. I mean, making 
insulin available for people on Medicare for $35 a month, making it possible for people to access CG, to be able to access GLP-1. That is the only way that people over 65 can get it for $35 a month or less um, for um, for that, that class of half CGM, half basal, um, you know, so, so thank you on that. Um, Anything that you all would like to see patients saying more to their peers or to their care partners or to their doctors or nurses? I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to the, I'm going back to the um, and again, what we've experienced in, in the conversations, that, that, that patient voice, that patient mobilization is critical. Um, Interesting when you go and knock on the doors of providers, um, you know, you have the real specialists who are into this. And then you have the sort of the early majority who, you know, can see through COVID and telehealth, there's a, there's a path forward, but uh, there's lots of reasons not to do this. I, I think, you know, it's still complex, it's still on top of a, a busy day. I think some of the comments we made earlier on around integration into EHRs, et cetera, that we've got to find some simpler ways to help get into the, the daily workflow and the daily mindset with HCP. Now, now, I know these might sound like frustrating points, um, but it's, we've got to sort of take each of these kind of pain points and try and alleviate them a little bit. And at the same time, all the good stuff we've been saying around um, patient empowerment, patient mobilization to help move people along and, and, and chip away. So I, I think that's what we've got to do. I think we've been in a space where there has been a lot of great technology um, with a few early adopters in the space from a, from a provider perspective. How to expand beyond that um, is where we are. So again, we have to go from the, 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 say the primary care physicians who are specialists in diabetes or really interested in technology, make it simpler for them, bring it to their workflow. Uh, and again, mm -hmm. plus the, the, the mobilized patient voice to try and get people to, to experiment. And, and we have this part to play to try and help, it, help take the data into their day-to-day -day lives as well. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm loving this. Others, Jeff, you know, you're going to jump in. The existing healthcare system, the way that it's structured, the way that it, 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 the way that it functions, it, it, it isn't working for everyone. In fact, it's working. It's not working at all for a huge popular the for a uh, uh, you know portion of the population that needs it the most. And so we've got to figure out a way to unlock the power of all of this real world data that we're talking about from wearables or connected devices, et cetera, to empower those people with mobile phones, living with chronic conditions, to make the critical changes for their health for themselves. Um, you use the word patient a lot, and I, you know me, and I've brought this up before, but we're talking about people, not patients. They're only patients 15 minutes every six months. They're people the other the rest of the time living their lives and making choices. And so we've got to empower those people and unlock the empowerment for those people with technology like data offers, with solutions like Chris offers, but making sure that, you know, that healthcare can be proactive and we can prevent problems before they start. Yes, and you make such a good point about patients. I'm sorry, I'm so old, I'm so old um, that I'm used to that. But you're right, it's really, really important. You know, also, I think a lot of people out there are seeing success. It's not zero, right? And so what is happening in those cases? And, you know, for, for what, what are the things that we can, you know, what are the things that we can learn from? We've got some really good, um, really good questions coming in from the audience. I'm just going to start with Mr. Uh, Mr. Hoskins, I'm not sure, but as an IT data security professional for the last 26 years, um, you know, how do you, how do, you, how would you all like to see data protected um, while still offering some access to others to access it? I think the individual should be able to control who gets to see their data and when. Period. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I. I believe that patients own the data. Mm -hmm. Patients should, we tell, we, we tell people with diabetes that these are all the ways we're going to protect them from um, where their data won't be um, seen or how it won't be used, but we don't give people the right to say where their data will be used. And we need to allow people the right to do that. People own their own data, I believe. And I think people should advocate for that. Mm -hmm. I've been a long believer of that. 
Yeah, I I love hearing that. I, again, I would like to hear in the subgroups, um, you know, maybe in more of these really large trials, what's what is happening while protecting the data, but also, um, you know, making sure that making sure that everybody um, you know knows what's happening out there. And Holly, as you say, that people people know their rights and all of that, and that we're all learning together. You know. None of us is doing well until all of us are doing well. And you're right, we have a long way to go um, before that's true, Jeff. Um, but in some of the subpopulations, I think we've, we've seen um, seen some progress there. I don't know if there are um, any more comments on that part. I'm gonna just add something to that question. And we got from um, the same amazing person in our audience, have there been any new treatment insights um, because of the explosion of data. And, you know, they're especially interested in managing type two with diet and exercise and how CGM has been invaluable in that. Um, so over to you guys, maybe maybe David, we'll start with you, but I know everyone um, has, has probably some ideas on this. Sure. Um, there are now several studies. We just, we just mm -hmm. had a study called the Mobile Study published in JAMA and that looked at people who were on basal insulin with or without um, oral agents, they weren't taking rapid acting insulin. So we call it non-intensive insulin therapy. And we saw striking benefits in the group that wore CGM compared to the group that really did optimized blood glucose monitoring. Um, and there was 3.6 hours less a day with, of glucose over 250. So really big, big changes, nice, nice reductions in, in A1C, in particular in those with the highest A1Cs. What was striking was that um, this occurred despite the fact that the insulin doses didn't change, the amount of prandial insulin didn't change, and the amount of med medications added or reduced was actually a little bit less in the CGM group than the SMBG group. So what does that suggest? It suggests that these people got the benefit because they were able to learn from their CGM. So they were able to modify their diet. They maybe exercise differently or exercise more. Maybe they were more adherent to the medications. We couldn't tease out. We tried, but we couldn't tease out what it was that, that drove these outcomes. But I think patients, when they wear CGM, they get that aha moment. And, you know, they're able to make modifications in their, in their lifestyle choices to get to minimize the time at high glucose, in particular with, you know, somebody who's on diet and exercise, you can figure out what works and what doesn't work for you. Um, so it, it really individualizes your approach. And, and again, we saw it in mobile, it's been seen in other studies, um, very, very similar findings. And David, it's, it's beyond the data itself, it's all those other aspects of empowerment. And then the more you see the result, the more motivated you are, I, I would imagine as well. So it's, it's that sort of feedback loop you're getting. So there's so much going on in that and um, being able to take control and have an impact. So yeah, it, it's a great point. And I was gonna say just the same thing around, uh, we now see the benefits of these intervention programs. And it's, it's not a surprise, isn't it? It's like having, having a coach there every day supporting you, you're gonna be better, whether it be doing sport or, or managing diabetes. And again, you know, all these tools help people take control of their condition. And uh, with the nudges and reminders, you, you get better outcomes. And at first you're surprised, and secondly, you're not a surprise at all, because it's pretty obvious, isn't it? You're, you're there 24 hours a day helping people not make better decisions, but hint and nudge and help uh, and advise and, and counsel people to, to do the right thing. So it's, it's fantastic to see. Yeah, and on, on that on that frame of hint and nudge, you know, I know I, we are lucky enough to live pretty close five blocks from a 24-hour Walgreens. I think it's one of the busiest ones in the whole country. And we have this awesome question from Keith Panavet um, on that topic. Pharmacists are often an integral part of patients' care. That is so true for me. We all know amazing pharmacists out there, um, you know, or many of us do. And Diana Isaacs, I'm looking at you. Thank you for helping us so much. I think everybody here over so much time. Um, but, you know, he, Keith is saying they're highly trusted, seen frequently, often have the most complete view of people's therapy. Um, they also might lack access to health data. That was so polite the way that you said that, um, you know, lacking access to labs, electronic health records. What are your guys' views on how diabetes data can best be used in the pharmacy? What are your biggest hopes and dreams about what could be possible? Hmm. Wouldn't it be nice if an individual could say, I would like Diana 
to have my record of and then be able to explicitly relate what Diana can see. Oh, hush, hush. That was really interesting. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Yeah, and I and I think all of the uh, uh, the companies that are represented here uh, on the panel are 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 very open to that kind of position. I know, um, uh, David. Again, I want to applaud Dexcom for the position that Dexcom has taken with sharing APIs, and uh, you know, it's it's really. You really took a leadership position in doing that, and um, you know that's the kind of thing where individuals, and then getting having standardized views where um, data can go through platforms to EHRs, and then you know Diana, the individual, can say yes, I want Diana to see these things. So you're putting control for the individual for uh, to say, or Kelly can say, yes, I want Diana to see these things because I want her opinion on it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I also I also think we're so, we're, we're lucky, I think if we're also asking systems with the United narrative about, you know, pharmacists having more access and, and more time and then being, being you know, compensated and reimbursed for that as well is good. Mm -hmm. I think also care partners, you know, I know for a long time, no, I want Johnny to think I'm really great. So I don't necessarily want him to see my data for me. I've been able to change some of that over time, but it's been harder. You know, it's been harder than I thought it would be. Um, any other um, thoughts on the panel about pharmacists or sharing data with others? Um, not we'll move in a moment to a question from Patrick Rao, but I don't want to, um, I want to make sure that you hear from everyone um, who would like to speak on that. This is a, it's a similar question, or it's a, along the same lines, it really is. Um, Patrick is asking, you know, how can we collect data that will show what works for many or most so that that helps shift norms um, related to eating habits, glucose monitoring, exercise, A1C, time and range. I love mm -hmm. this. Yeah. I mean, we do that at OneDrop with our predictions. We're really taking the data from millions of people and using machine learning to really figure out what not only works for um, you know, the group of people, the population, but then also what's going to work for you and consistently learn over time um, what people, what work, what has worked for people and then what's gonna work for you. Um, and so, you know, everybody's unique, everybody's, every, everybody's body is different, everybody's diabetes is different. And so what works for me might not work for you, Kelly. Um, and so, you know, we're, using you know vast sums of data and then machine learning to really really try to understand um, what's going to work for most people and then how can we apply that to you yeah I, I think that there that that makes complete sense to me you take the macro uh, data access and then you can apply it to the individual as well that I I know that that's something that uh, Years back, that was, and I, I presume, and Gluco, I think, is still doing that. And I know that the QII project at uh, the T1D exchange, uh, you know, they're doing that within um, clinics, and there are lots of, uh, of things that are going on there. I'm, I'm sort of I'm sort of thinking too about maybe the the ecosystem out there and you know maybe what we're seeing in other countries that do have more standardized approaches. Um, do you guys do you think it would be valuable to look at some of that? Um, I, I'm trying to answer just just see where you guys can answer you know some of the questions out here about what's working and you know what are we seeing for different patients? Um, do you, do you think we'll get to see more about what is um, what is going well that can be traced back to policy, for example, or to um, things like access to food? You know, we have challenges, um, like, like, like a significant challenge we have, like related to that question is, we don't know when somebody eats or what they eat. Now, there are 
some, some really good apps that collect that data. Um, so for specific users that are, are willing to log their, their food, you, you, could, you could do that. And we have some good extra, there's some really good exercise apps. I'm, Jeff, I'm sure you know, you know a lot more about this than I do that could give some insights around the impact of, of exercise um, in, in just different, different populations. But, you know, but one of the major issues for somebody with type 2 diabetes is what do I eat and how does that impact me? And that's really hard data to get at right now. Um, Jeff, you, you might want to comment on, on that further. Yeah, and I mean, type one's different, obviously, because you don't know if somebody's taking basil or, or whether. Yeah. Um, but generally, if you look at a broad enough population, you can, I mean, you can kind of see when people are eating um, by 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 looking at their glucose information. I mean, glucose is an, an interesting proxy to 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 food. Um, it's not necessarily 100 percent correlated, but it it certainly, you know, there 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 is some interesting ways in which you can t obviously tell. You know, when you see somebody's glucose spike way up, um, it is likely, you know, that food is 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 in the mix there. Um, right. I was getting at specific foods. Like you don't know if somebody's for breakfast has had cereal and milk or egg and a bagel. So it's hard to to get, you know, in terms of understanding data that will determine what is the healthiest breakfast. We don't. It's hard to get at in in the real world. Yeah, and I, I think. That's retrospectively understanding what somebody ate and then what happened to them when they ate it, I think is 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 difficult. You know, trying to make it as brainless as possible in terms of um, you know making making that easy for people to log is something that we've been working on our brainless food logging. Um, but you know I, 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 I would agree. Um, you know we, we try to we've actually tried to look at other ways in which we can gain you know in essence a proxy for what people are eating. Yeah, I think it's I think it's also so so interesting. Maybe it's also that we're in a world where you know people's looking out to have access even to just smartphones. We expect it to completely work. I remember when the iPhone came out and then all of a sudden it didn't like you copy and paste. People were really upset. You know, then that got fixed. But maybe maybe sometimes the expectations are too high. Um, I don't know what all of you what all of you might think about that, um, or just how much the apps are going to be improving over time and so forth. I think you're going to see massive improvements in both both people's access to the technology, um, their ability to take action on the information that some of these technologies provide, um, and then inevitably the outcomes and then the cost savings associated with it. And when you can bring all that together, I think that's where, where what you call success. And I, I'm I'm very very bullish as as you'd expect me to be, but um, on on the power of what technology is going to do to the future for precision health. Yeah, and you guys, anyone who is not getting one drops newsletter, I mean, it's also like Jeff knows so much and has brought so much to our world on just again like the design and the delivery i love your newsletter when i get it every week it makes me feel successful you know and it makes me feel not alone so you know it's a, yet another reason why diatribe loves working with you and um, we've got an amazing question here from zoe heineman and she's um she's also asked for some of that data and um, by the way on the severe hypo 230,000 people that was cdc data from 2016 and um, we're hoping to get an update on that but that was reported in 2020 that's also to around 250,000 people going to the hospital for dka we would obviously like to see that much 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 closer to zero um maybe not in every case because of the diagnoses um but um that's where that's coming from zoe is asking you know what did the panelists go would work you know that we don't have yet at all um they they want to know your big ideas about you know what what you would like to see everyone working together to build or i imagine to work together more on in a cohesive way so for me this runs on from the last question and um if we just look around the, the panelists and where we all sit in the, the diabetes and data community we all come from a slightly different position we have something a little bit to, different to offer and, you know, I guess I'm on the, the you know, sort of the furthest in the clinical sense, but, you know, as the conversation went, you know, there is so much yet untapped bringing all of the, the lifestyle, the exercise, all those other social factors into the, you know, the, the algorithms and the analogs of how we calculate all of this. So, so for me, it, the, the big idea or the big dream, I hope, is not so far away where we really start to bolt all these bits together and then really start to overlay all the different bits of information 
you know the the clinical data you know the some of the the monitoring and then the really the, the lifestyle factors to, to give that complete picture and um, and from a technology perspective there's no reason why that can't happen soon but it's it's a lot of coordination working together to make that happen jeff i think you're the guy for the job i can see it so, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think an area that we all should be working on is getting rid of the disparities in healthcare, um, and that is it is so sad when you have poor poor, poor people that can't access um, medications, they can't access monitoring devices, they can't access um, disease management, um, and they're left on their own. And, and it ties back to to the the big picture that um, Jeff and Holly were talking about earlier. But you know, I think we all need to to really help out. Um, those that are less fortunate and, and work together to, to solve that. Yeah, well said. Yeah. yeah, and we love to see the way that you guys are doing that, um, David, and even more we know as volume goes up um, for, for CGM, so many opportunities there to be smarter about the chips you're using, you know, to be smarter about all of those pieces that will go into being able to make it cheaper. And um, we get it, it's not, we get it that it's not easy, um, but love to, Love to hear more about the ecosystem working together, including the payers, um, obviously, including the payers, payers, but the PBMs, you know, the different employers, you know, which employers are the best at that. Those some of those questions are still are still out there. Um, if if I, I want to tell um, I want to tell everybody what the last question is going to be. And if you have other things that you want to talk about with Zo uh, Zoe's question, I know a lot of you um, also um, have talked before about that so much is here um but if you have other big ideas that you would like to talk about with that um i really want to make sure that you have the chance to do that and for the audience um you've been amazing there's so much on chat that we're so grateful for and that we would like to play back to you and and respond to you and i know that some of that is going to be sharice's work um but for the panelists they're going to talk about their last question this is going to be more of a lightning round but you know what's the one thing about diabetes data and the future holds that all of you want to say. So, you know, the single thing, um, whether that's the patients or healthcare providers or payers or policymakers, um, et cetera. So. I love this, by the way, I'm going to read you what Michael, Michael Herney, you guys can be thinking about that a little bit if you have a big idea or if you if you just want to say what's your singular one piece. Um, but Michael saying he started in 1958 before disposable syringes and needles or blood checks were even available, you know, without going to get a, going to a lab, oil needles and syringes and only U40 and U80 insulin. Um, much less developed than now, CGMs, BIOS, Lantus are all unbelievable and wonderful for me to help manage diabetes. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, I mean, Chris, you guys, I mean, you've been a pioneer in this stuff. You transformed insulin being used in primary care. It was so cool to see. And now looking at how to, how to best use BGM and CGM and all of that is also very exciting. So maybe, maybe Kelly, if I, I start on this one. Um, thank you. I think about the five five years my daughter has been um, diagnosed and had type one, and I think about the progress we have made. So I'm optimistic, um, you know, I, and I'm I'm quite a pragmatist as well. I I try not to look too far ahead, but at the same time I'm a you know I'm very positive and optimistic around what's coming. So in that five years, you know, she's gone from being diagnosed as an eight year old with um, you, you know multiple daily uh, doses um, of insulin injections now to the the pump and the CGM and hopefully the closed loop and not far around the corner for her. So um, I think it's great. I think, as you said, there is so much happening so quickly um, and so much to learn. It's we're in a really, we're living the future now, right? This is the, this is the moment it's all happening for us. But I do think we need to be a little bit patient and persistent as well, right? We have all this stuff. We need to give it time. We talked about the outcomes generation. It is important that we generate data in the right way to go back to the likes of payers to place the right value Get the right reimbursement and hence the right access um, for these technologies so we do need to work on that as well as bring the exciting um, new technologies forward so for me it's that kind of mix of optimism um patience and persistence required by all of us to, to and we'll get somewhere and then we'll know we're going to go on again and it's going to be a little bit exponential so for me that's why i am overall optimistic that we're in a great moment and i think if i go back to my daughter i think her for her her future i think is is a good one um as, as a worried parent 
of a daughter living with type 1 diabetes? For me, you know, I, I think healthcare has got to be continuous. It's got to be proactive and it's got to be personalized for the individual. And by making it easier for us to access our own health data and become empowered to take action on it and doing that on simple things like mobile phones, we can help millions of people realize their full potential and reimagine what's possible for them. I mean, we can't keep throwing money at treating the symptoms of sickness and neglect the investment in prevention required to keep people healthy. Um, so again, you know, it's really important, continuous, proactive, and personalized. I don't think I can. I know, that's poetry, isn't it, Holly? Yeah, yeah. it is. I don't think I can add more than what's already been said. Oh, but I think it's about, I think it's about access, it's about prevention, and it's about pulling all of these components together and really making it work so that we uh, we we keep it simple and we ease ease the, the data can ease the burden, not add to it. And um, and I think that the time is now to advocate for that. I'm going to take a little different approach, and I'd like people to think less about data. So I would like there to be solutions for type one and type two diabetes, whether it's automated insulin delivery beta cell replacement or for type two diabetes, some of these miraculous drugs that are coming down the pipeline so that people don't have to think about the data. They're gonna go on a therapy, much like statins. And you could think a lot less about, you know, what you have to do if you're on a statin because you get such good results. I'd love to see that. I'd like to people, people with diabetes to not have to think about glucose because their glucose is controlled. So that's where I would love us to get to down the road. I know that we're also going to be collecting thoughts from everyone in the audience and you're going to have a chance to share at the community sessions and maybe if you want to do networking one and have three minutes with um, somebody else out there that you haven't talked to um there's a lot here and there's there's a lot of power and there is um there's a lot of thinking to do about all of all of the different parts of the ecosystem um we cannot begin to thank our sponsors enough for making these conversations possible and also making it possible for us to do some really good thinking out there um thank you to every person with diabetes and look at this um for joining us and to our entire diatribe team um for doing so much to make this happen um you know Cheers, and I think we're going to be sent off any minute into the into the other opportunities that we still have to connect today. But appreciation all around. Let's give a cheer to these panelists for giving so much so much for us to to think about and then act on. What a great group! Thank you, Holly, David, Chris, and Kelly. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And really, really interesting. Thank you. Inspiring. Yeah.